Welcome to the Whitmer Cast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. My name is Katherine Pollock, and I'm currently a master's student at Missouri State University's Department of Religious Studies, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. We have a great episode lined up for you. We'll be talking to Casey Paul Griffiths. If you would like to join JWHA or visit our entire backlog of episodes in JWHA journals, go to jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. Today, I have the pleasure to be joined by Casey Paul Griffiths. He is a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. His research interests are the history of Latter-day Saint education, diverse movements in the Restoration, and the church in the Pacific. His first two books are What You Don't Know About the 100 Most Important Events in Church History, co-authored by Mary Jane Woodger and Susan Easton Black, and 50 Relics of the Restoration, co-authored with Mary Jane Woodger. Casey, I'm excited to talk with you about your latest book, Truth Seeker, The Life of Joseph F. Merrill, Scientist, Educator, and Apostle. But first, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your involvement in JWHA? Yeah, happy to. I uh, grew up in Utah. I'm kind of a born and bred member of the Utah Church, the Mountain Saints, if that's the term you want to use. Um, but I've always been uh, super curious about community of Christ from the time I was a missionary to the first time that I visited Independence and saw the temple. I've always wanted to know a little bit more and also wanted to be able to separate truth from myth about community of Christ, which there's a lot of myth <laughs> in Utah about community of Christ. So uh, when I got put on the faculty at BYU, I started to research topics related to community of Christ and other branches of the restoration. And eventually was invited by Keith Wilson and Robert Millett and a few other people to be part of the uh, interfaith dialogue team. The BYU has that works with community of Christ and other restoration branches. And so over the course of the next few years, I just became dear, dear friends with many people from Community of Christ. I'm still part of the dialogue team. We meet about every six months or so and have a discussion on topics like uh, scripture or uh, we've had a discussion on ordinances. We've had discussions on um, personhood, all kinds of things, the apostasy and the restoration. And uh, through those discussions, we've just become really, really uh, good friends. I was responsible for organizing a, a trip of scholars from Community of Christ who came to Utah and actually uh, spoke at BYU to our students, spoke to our faculty. We all went to a temple open house together. We all toured through the Jordan uh, River Temple. Uh, we all went to a performance of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So uh, I just got good friends for life. And my next book is is going to be a, a collection of essays written by scholars uh, from Community of Christ and from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, just comparing our beliefs, how far apart we are, some places where we can connect and, and other places where we agree to disagree. All right, so next let's talk about your biography. So Casey's okay. biography focuses on Joseph F. Merrill, a lesser known figure in 19th and 20th century church history. There are a number of parts of his life that'll be of great interest to our audience today. Merrill lived from 1868 to 1952. He was a young adult when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints formally ended polygamy and he lived the church's transition in, into the American mainstream. He was one of the first native Utahns to earn a PhD and was a professor at the University of Utah for 35 years. He was then called to the Office of Church Commissioner of Education in 1928 during the early years of the Seminary Institute programs. He helped create the Department of Religion at Brigham Young University. And in 1933, he was called an apostle where he served for the rest of his life. You see, so how did you get interested in Joseph F. Merrill and to want to write a whole biography about him? 
Uh, well, Catherine, just like you, I was a master's student in search of a thesis topic. Um, and I had a couple ideas rolling around in my head, but nothing that was really like clicking. And one day I was having uh, lunch with Scott Esplin, who's a good friend. He's the dean at uh, the College of Religious Education in BYU. And now he is. Back then we were just both uh, teachers. And he said, did you know Joseph uh, F. Merrill's papers have been deposited at BYU? which was kind of rare in our church. Uh, most of the time, if an apostle, when they pass away, their papers were given to the church, and then they kind of are, uh, are, are placed away for a number of decades until whatever controversies they were involved in has died down. Merrill's papers were donated by his family several decades after his death, uh, and there was no restrictions on anything in them. And so that afternoon, I went down to special collections, and I realized there was over 40 boxes of material. I started to read through it and realized, boy, this is dynamite stuff. And from there, I was off and running. I wrote my master's thesis on Merrill's educational contributions to the church. And then once that was completed, I just kept going. Um, and it took about 10 years or so, but eventually I was able to construct a full biography from mostly from the materials that were there, but other places too. I went to a number of different universities. I talked to Merrill family members uh, and really have been running around for, I, well, since 2007 in some way, shape or form, I've been involved in this research. So it's wonderful to finally see the book in print. It's kind of a miracle in and of itself. And I'll add, I don't think this book would be in print if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So that's at least one good thing that came out of it is when we all got put into lockdown in the spring of 2020, I went back to the manuscript and realized I got to get this done. And so with all the spare time I had, I shaped it up. I edited it. I submitted it to my publisher. And here it is. It's a miracle. Now, Joseph Merrill was an apostle who was the son of an apostle. His father was Mariner Merrill, who was a stake president, president of the Logan Temple before becoming an apostle. And his mother was Marina and that was Mariner's fourth wife, and Joseph was the first child. Can you tell us what his growing up years were like? We actually have a ton of information about his uh, years growing up. And that's one of the interesting contrasts is I think one of the contributions this uh, biography makes is that when people think about the Utah Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the two stereotypes they have are either like these polygamists that have like really long beards um, and live in the mountains and have multiple wives. And then in contrast, you know, other people that are like really conservative and have short haircuts and are clean shaven and wear businessmen suits and things like that. And Joseph Merrill's life bridges the gap between those two eras. Uh, his dad has eight wives and lives with them all in and around the Richmond area. Each wife had their own house and was relatively independent. Joseph's mother was named Maria, a Maria Kingsbury Merrill. And she kind of ran the farm on her own. A mariner provided financial and emotional support, but he was also constantly moving from home to home to make sure that every one of his families were okay. And I think that had a big impact on Joseph and the way he saw women and what they were capable of, uh, what they could do. I think his mother was a big inspiration to him because she was so independent in her life uh, that he sort of sought out women that were independent and strong and smart and capable uh, the rest of his life too. As to plural marriage, um, we don't talk about it a lot in the church <laughs> today, but Joseph really thought it was a great family arrangement. Like he didn't feel like he was neglected or that his mom was neglected. In fact, I found a letter later on in his life where someone asked about plural marriage, and he basically said, I'm glad I wasn't asked to practice it. But when I was a child, it felt like a great family arrangement. Uh, Mariner took care of his families and made sure that his kids got education. A large number of Mariner's children, we're talking, I think, around 27 or something like that, received college degrees, both boys and girls. And the Merrill family produced a fair number of PhDs. In fact, Joseph Merrill was the first native Utah to get a PhD. And so, I mean, at the same time, too, there's this dark side, right? He, he talks about 
the federal marshals raiding his farm to try and find his dad because he was practicing uh, plural marriage in violation of the laws of the land. So, I mean, on the one hand, he has this ideal family life where his mom and dad love each other. On the other hand, he could point out like the secret place they had in their basement where the wall was fake uh, so that it, they could stash his dad if the Fed showed up. And it doesn't seem like that was a large part of his life, that polygamy didn't cause a lot of chaos, especially. But there's those two sides there, right? And the other thing, too, is his dad hired tutors for them. Um, his dad encouraged them to get education. He said, uh, interestingly, that he felt like his dad had a testimony, but wasn't like overtly spiritual, that he listened to his dad pray and he knew that his dad loved the gospel and the scriptures and things like that. But his dad wasn't overly preachy uh, when they were together. And again, um, they they seem to have this good relationship. There's all kinds of letters between Joseph and his dad when he goes back east to go to school. And I think if there's one area where maybe there's conflict, it's that Merrill's dad, Mariner, grows up in kind of the mystical early world of Mormonism. He talks about like seeing visions and dreams. One of the most famous stories associated with Mariner Merrill was that when he was president of the Logan Temple, he looked out and saw Satan standing on um, the lawn of the temple and walked out and confronted Satan basically and told him to get out of here. He had all these kind of mystical experiences. And Joseph, on the other hand, growing up, felt like he just didn't match his dad uh, when it came to those kinds of experiences. In fact, the most common story he told about his youth was that his dad had told him to pray and ask if the church was true. And Merrill had prayed from the ages of 8 to 18 every single night in his remembrance and not gotten any kind of spiritual experience. In fact, he said he recalled praying the night before he was supposed to leave home and go to the University of Deseret, which is now the University of Utah, and knelt down one last time thinking nothing's going to happen, but I've committed to do this, and prayed. And then he did get a spiritual experience. Uh, it was the night before he was supposed to start his undergraduate education. And he noted that as, as one of the most significant experiences of his life, and felt like the timing was um, precise, that he hadn't had those experiences earlier because he needed to have that experience right before he went to college. Otherwise, he may have wavered in his faith uh, when he was doing his studies. He goes off to college. First, he studies chemistry, mm -hmm. and then he meets Laura Hyde, an urban woman from Salt Lake City. Can you tell us more about Laura and their relationship and her influence on his life? Laura was one of the real surprises of this research, and I wish that there was more material available about her. Laura, so Joseph is the son of an apostle. Laura is the granddaughter of two apostles. She's the granddaughter of John Taylor, who's president of the church, and Orson Hyde, who's an original member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. So she's kind of, you know, Mormon royalty. And they meet together at the University of Deseret, and they, they click. They have this connection immediately. They date. They get pretty serious. Uh, at a certain point, Joseph decides he's going to go east to get his PhD. He's going to go to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And before he leaves, he proposes to her. <laughs> and surprisingly, her dad turns him down to tells them to not get engaged. Uh, not because he hated Joseph or anything like that, but he didn't want them to get engaged and then him to leave and go to school and leave her there all alone. So during the time when he's in Baltimore, there's this extensive series of correspondences back and forth between Joseph and, and Laura. In fact, one of the letters, I opened it up and a lock of her hair fell out of it. Like she had clipped off a lock of her hair and sent it to him. It was this kind of dirty blonde um, <laughs> thing that maybe nobody had seen for a hundred years since the letter was originally sent. Uh, but their correspondence actually was, was one of the most delightful things that I got to read where Laura is this bright, articulate, politically involved person. She has really strong feelings about politics. And Joseph is this bright, articulate scholar who isn't as involved in politics, but the two of them are intensely involved in the church. 
And it's this time period when the church is undergoing some serious transformation. Uh, the practice of plural marriage um, ends, or at least forming new plural marriages in 1890. And Joseph and Laura are part of the first generation that kind of grows up without plural marriage being a prominent part of the church. And so they write back and forth about plural marriage and women in the priesthood and social issues. And honestly, some of their letters are things that you would expect a, a Latter-day Saint boy and girl to write each other about uh, today. And they're having these sophisticated discussions where, you know, Joseph is saying, I'm studying, but it's hard because there's no other people here that believe the same as me. And Laura is encouraging him at the same time. She's asking him about his views on politics. She was a really staunch Democrat, uh, by the way. And she kind of persuades Joseph to leave his family's political preference, which was that they were Republicans, and uh, move over and join the Democrats, which he becomes a lifelong Democrat. So what did Laura think about women in the priesthood? She felt like there was no reason why women couldn't hold the priesthood. In fact, one argument that they, they kind of pick apart is the idea that, that that's still taught in the church to a certain degree that women hold priesthood jointly with their husbands. Laura kind of responds to this by saying, if that's the case, then why are single women allowed to go to the temple? Um, he, she also was aware of certain talks that Joseph Smith had given to the Relief Society in Nauvoo, where he called them a, a kingdom of priests and priestesses. Um, she was aware that the temple liturgy, which still exists in the church, uses phrases like priests and priestesses to describe it. So she didn't really feel like marriage was necessary for a woman to say that they held and exercised priest's authority. And like I said, these are views that um, and, and topics we're still having discussions over in the church. So, and it seems like Joseph wasn't necessarily opposed to it or anything like that. He was supportive of her. He was supportive of her ideals and the things that she was involved in. It feels like they were both very, very involved Latter-day Saints too. But when it came to the question of women in the priesthood, they, were, they weren't discussing anything that should change in the church. They were trying to discuss what was already happening in the church, like the language used in the temple ceremonies, and what those implications were for men and women in the church. How many kids do they have together? Uh, six kids, I believe. Um, um, six kids together. That's one of the sad things is they have this brilliant correspondence the first two years that he's he comes home to Utah and he marries Laura, and then she goes back to Johns Hopkins with him. And from there, the correspondence kind of disappears. In fact, for the next 20 years, uh, they're a married couple, and married couples didn't write each other very much. So actually, their long-distance relationship was great for historians, but the sources we have for Laura kind of drop off uh, after those first two years of his graduate education. And other than she's head of the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, um, I looked through newspapers in Salt Lake and Laura was incredibly active in like inviting prominent scholars, inviting um, Native American leaders, inviting all kinds of people to, to lecture at their home. She actually gives a lecture in the Logan Temple right after they get married. But Laura uh, gets cancer and um, and dies in 1917. And so she, she kind of has what happens to a lot of men and women that start young families. They have a lot of documents early on in their life when they're single and they're corresponding with people. And then they get really busy raising children and they don't produce very many documents. There's not a lot of documents from Joseph from this period either. And then before Laura had a chance to get older and start to write her life story, or start corresponding extensively again, she, she passed away. She died in 1917 of, of cancer. Well, they were a couple together, Joseph Merrill. So he gets a PhD in physics from John Hopkins. And then he, he goes on to be, be, a, be a professor at the University of Utah. And he does a lot to help the college. Can you describe Merrill's accomplishments with that? And did he have any struggles while as a teacher there? He had a great experience. The University of Utah was founded by Brigham Young. Like I mentioned earlier, it was originally called the University of Deseret. And uh, Joseph Merrill, right from the first time he set foot at the University of Utah, loved the environment, but kind of also felt the tension <laughs> um, that, that existed 
between Latter-day Saint society and the university, uh, which was seen as, you know, supposed to be a secular field, but there was this tension of, well, do Latter-day Saints control the university or is the university independent? So early on, his career is brilliant. He founds the School of Mines and Engineering. Uh, there's still the, the engineering school at the University of Utah is still named the Joseph F. Merrill Building. And everybody loves him. It seems like he's on the rise. Uh, Joseph's uncle, um, Joseph Kingsbury, uh, who was the president of the University of Utah. And it seems like Joseph was his right-hand man. And really kind of his pick to head the university after Kingsbury was ready to retire. So for the first couple of years, his rise is meteoric. Like everything he does turns out great. The School of Mines expands. He becomes influential in Utah politics, even thinks about uh, running for state senate and things like that. And then around 1915, after he's been at the university for 15 years or so, he has some real, real bad setbacks, um, starting with a major controversy where Kingsbury just out and out fired several professors. We don't know, well, we, we know a lot about it, but the the headline that was given was because they were in conflict with the church or something like that, which is weird because Joseph Kingsbury was born in the church, but not really ever an active church member. But this controversy kind of blew up. Even John Dewey from the University of Chicago got involved, and Kingsbury basically loses his position as president of the university. And when he goes down, he sort of takes away the momentum that Joseph Merrill had to become the president of the university. At the same time, too, when all this controversy is happening, it's the same time that Laura gets sick. And so Joseph kind of has to withdraw a little bit from the involvement at the university because he's taking care of his wife. He has six kids ranging from teenagers to just infants at home and has to help with them, too. And in spite of all that he can do and all of his faith and science, Laura passes away. Uh, then there's another so named Joseph Merrill uh, dies during the Spanish influenza of 1918. So in the span of just three or four years, he loses his prestige at the university. He loses his wife, who's his closest friend. He loses his oldest son, and he is just sort of reeling uh, from it. But I will say his work at the university is, is, is super important because he sees himself as both a believer and a scholar and thinks that he can bridge the gap between the two. One of the quotes uh, that, that he shares at the university is he said something like, the Gentiles regarded us as a Mormon institution. The Mormons looked upon us as an infidel factory. Hence, we did not enjoy the whole support of either faction. We found ourselves between the devil and the deep blue sea. In fact, that was originally the name of the book, The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, because a lot of his life was him trying to navigate the world of faith and the world of um, science. That uh, Merrill stayed a faithful, active church member his entire life, but was also a prominent scientist. And there were then, and still are some people today that feel like those two worlds are irreconcilable, but he really felt like they were they were, that they were the same thing, that all he was doing was seeking the truth, whether it was in the field of religion or whether it was in fields of science. So after Laura passes away from cancer, Joseph Merrill marries again to Millie, an immigrant convert to the church. What was his second marriage like and what was her influence on him? His second marriage was the was the marked contrast to his first marriage. They were both happy marriages, but where Laura was kind of like Latter Day Saint royalty, um, Millie, whose name was Emily, that everybody just called her Millie. Uh, Millie was a convert to the church. In fact, I looked in the records and found that Millie was literally baptized the day before they got married to each other. And so, where Laura grows up in the church and is known by everybody and kind of has this you know, outgoing personality. Millie is shy and reserved and knows practically nothing about Latter-day Saint culture. She's a Lutheran uh, from Minnesota that converted to the church. And so for the first couple of years, they, it, it does seem like they, they had sort of a rocky start to their marriage. <laughs> There's a place in his journal where he notes like how stubborn she is and the, how set in her ways she could be and what a challenge that was. And there were days, too, when he wrote about how much he missed his um, his first wife, how much he missed Laura, and how 
you know, suited they were to each other. But it was interesting uh, because, I mean, he's married to both of them for about the same period of time. He and Millie start out rocky, but then kind of grow together, you know, when he gets called as a mission president, which I can't think of a more immersing experience in Latter-day Saint culture than being a mission president, a mission president's wife. They both go to Europe together. He serves as the European mission president and she keeps a journal there. And, you know, she always talks about how much she hates public speaking and hates talking in public, but she does kind of grow into this role and becomes more and more kind of involved in understanding of of Latter-day Saint culture, becomes more fluent in the language of Latter-day Saint culture. Uh, And unfortunately, uh, she dies suddenly in in 1940. Uh, That's about 22 years or so after they get married. And it's devastating to him. Like when he loses uh, Millie, it's just as serious a blow as it is when he loses Laura. But where he and Laura kind of clicked immediately and always had this, this really involved marriage, it did take time for him and Millie to kind of grow together and through their shared experience, uh, learn to accept each other and uh, and build a happy marriage too. They, they never have any children together either because I think Millie is a little bit older when, uh, when they get married. She might have been past her, her child bearing years. But I did talk to family members too that knew Millie and everybody said... They loved her, that um, they they called her Aunt Millie because it was hard for them to acknowledge that their mom had been replaced. And actually, aunt is like an old polygamous term. You'd call, you know, your dad's the other wife, your aunt. <laughs> uh, so they may have borrowed that from that. But they all got along with her and liked her. Felt like, you know, for the younger children, she w- she kind of became their mom and, and took care of them. And even though she... He wasn't as, and Millie was, Millie was a great support to him and dearly loved by him. In fact, one of the interesting things about this biography was, was the role of women in his life. Like it starts out with uh, his wife, Laura, and then his wife, Millie, after Laura passes away. And then after Millie dies, the most important woman in his life is his daughter, Laura, who's named after his first wife who he spends the final years of his life with. And unfortunately, who also dies of cancer. The second Laura dies of the same cancer that the first Laura dies from. And once again, at the end of his life, Joseph Merrill is is forced to watch a woman named Laura that he dearly loves just kind of fight bravely this disease, but eventually succumb to it. Now, Joseph Merrill had a big influence on Latter-day Saint education. So Before I ask this question, for anybody who doesn't know, what is a seminary and what is an institute? (laughs) Flattery Saints. Yeah. Um, So seminaries um, exist in the Intermountain West, um, most prominently in Utah and Idaho. But there's seminaries in uh, Wyoming, uh, a smattering in Washington and Oregon, some in Arizona, even some in Nevada. Seminary is basically theological education for teenagers. Uh, It exists everywhere in the church in one form or other. There's early morning seminary, which takes place before school, some that takes place after. There's online seminary. But in areas like this, where there's a prominent number of Latter-day Saints, uh, release time seminary is the main thing. I was a release time seminary teacher. It was my full-time job. And basically what happens is uh, next to a public high school, there's a seminary building that is owned by the church. Uh, for one period, uh, students are released from school and allowed to walk over to the seminary building. And there they uh, receive instruction in the scriptures and the restoration scriptures. They don't get a school credit for it. So it's a little bit of a sacrifice for them. Uh, but Merrill starts this system. And then later on, he basically builds the college equivalent of a seminary building, which is an institute of religion, which I think there's around 400 institutes of religion uh, spread throughout the United States and around the world, where next to a university where there's a number of Latter-day Saints um, students uh, can go and receive theological training, take classes on scripture or classes on social issues and things like that. And so uh, Merrill is the originator of that system, which is still probably the most prominent educational system. Just to compare, uh, there's around 30,000 students at Brigham Young University. 
Uh, worldwide, I believe there's around 700,000 Institute students and probably more seminary students than that. I, I can't recall the numbers right now. Uh, so the educational mechanisms that we still use even in the 21st century were largely play, put into place by Joseph Merrill in the early 20th century. That's probably his most important contribution to the church. So you talk about the history of Latter-day Saint education before Joseph Merrill, and mm -hmm. you said they had academies. Can you describe that history for us? Yeah, so academies were basically church-run um, high schools. And in the late 19th century, the church basically started an initiative to try and build an academy in, in every community in the Intermountain West that Latter-day Saints had founded. Some were more successful than others, but you did have, uh, give or take, around 30 to 40 academies operating at any given time. Some of these were boarding schools, so it was like Hogwarts, you know, a person would leave home and spend the year at the school. Sometimes they lived in town and came to the academy. The academies taught, you know, all kinds of secular subjects, but generally had religion classes as well. And they also had a widespread religion class system so that if there was no academy, a person could go and still receive religious training. What distinguishes the academies, though, is that there was no professional religious religion faculty, as far as I can tell. So you would have your English teacher uh, teach a class on the Book of Mormon, or you would have your um, biology teacher uh, in the afternoon teach a class on the Old Testament or something like that. And these academies start to decline in the early 20th century as public schools are built in around the Intermountain West. So the dilemma for parents were academies cost money. You know, you had to pay tuition for your kid to go to a church academy. Public schools were free. And while some kids had to travel and board at a church academy, there was usually a public school in their town. So right around 1912 or so, the academies actually peak in their student population and start to decline the same time that public high schools surpass them. The year that enrollment in public schools in Utah first surpassed church academies was the year Joseph Merrill launched the seminary system, which the idea behind the seminary system was is his kids were going to go to a public high school. They lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, and there was a school just a couple blocks away from where the Merrills lived. So Merrill and a lot of parents in the church were worried that if their kids went to a public high school, they wouldn't get the kind of training in religion that they wanted them to have. So his idea was basically, why don't we build religion department across the street. And that's literally what they do. Like they build a, a house. The original seminary looked like one of these bungalow houses that you'd see in, in parts of Salt Lake to this day. And he basically arranged with the local school board to allow the kids to be released part of the day. They found a teacher, Thomas Yates, and the kids started doing what Latter-day Saints in the West still do, the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants, and then go back to the school. But Merrill actually was able to arrange for them to get credit for it. Uh, they got credit for Bible studies into the 1970s uh, because of the precedent he set at Granite High School. And this system becomes so successful that other seminaries start opening throughout other places in the West. Second one opens in Brigham City in 1915. By 1920, the church did an analysis and realized that it cost one-tenth as much to educate a seminary student as it did to educate a student at the academies. And they basically made the decision to close all the academies or transfer them to state control. A lot of the academies became public high schools and instead build seminaries next to all the schools. And that's been the system since the 1920s into the 2020s. And you wrote that some of these academies become junior colleges. Yeah, they when they closed the academies, they decided if they couldn't run the school system, the next best thing. And so four academies, Rick's College and Dixie, Snow and Weber, all these schools still exist today. Uh, were elevated to the status of junior colleges. And the basic idea behind that was you would have uh, Brigham Young University, and you'd also have Latter-day Saint University, which was in downtown Salt Lake. And then you'd have these four other junior colleges where you could train the teachers that would teach in the high schools. And in that sense, you know, we basically had kind of a stealth academy system where the academy, well, the, the high schools were public high schools that were paid for by the state, but almost all the teachers were Latter-day Saints that had been trained at a Latter-day Saint 
uh, school. And so you'd have your religion specialist across the street in the seminary building, but you'd also have a biology teacher that was probably a believing Latter-day Saint that could help you figure out how biology doesn't conflict with the gospel and kind of navigate those complicated issues with testimony. Actually, it was a pretty ingenious system when it comes down to it. Now there's a big sort of state conflict if they don't conflict with church-state relations. Yeah, the state constitution of Utah basically says that public schools can engage in sectarian teaching. The credit that these students were receiving was for biblical studies, which was seen as a legitimate academic subject. But by 1930, the seminary system is in full swing. And basically, the state high school inspector, a guy named Isaac L. Williamson, uh, visits the schools and points out a number of irregularities that basically the seminaries were part of the schools just in a separate building. So he pointed out things like the seminary teachers were in the high school yearbook and that the high school and the seminaries shared attendance information with each other, which technically should have been private. And that in the seminaries, in classes that they were teaching for high school credit, teachers were, you know, interjecting sectarian teachings. So you're teaching the Old Testament, for instance, and you say, well, the prophet Joseph Smith said this about this. Uh, That was something that sort of tripped up Isaac Williamson. And so he writes the scathing report. It's huge. It takes up an entire page of the Salt Lake Tribune in the smallest possible print you can imagine. And I know because when I was writing my thesis, I had to spend I think it took 12 hours to transcribe that entire report. It wound up being around 22 pages where he just goes through, hey, here's all the church and state violations. And he basically tries to ban the seminary system. And so right at the moment when um, the church has abandoned its academies, it looks like seminaries are going to be made illegal. And so Joseph Merrill, who's by now is the commissioner of education in the church, he's left the University of Utah. In 1928, he starts heading, uh, serving as church commissioner of education, all of a sudden has to jump in and argue that the seminaries can continue. Uh, He has to argue directly in front of the state board. More importantly, he kind of has to wage a a war of public opinion. Um, So he writes articles that go in newspapers and gives interviews where he basically says, yeah, if there's some irregularity, we're going to fix it, but let's don't throw the whole system out. And basically, he's able to persuade enough members of the Utah State Board that at the time was split between Latter-day Saints and non-Latter-day Saints to continue to allow the seminary system to continue. Now, they do make some reforms, um, especially uh, with how teachers interact with schools and they're very, very clear about curriculum. Uh, One problem was that they just didn't have good curriculum. So these Latter-day Saint teachers, these seminary teachers were kind of falling back on what they'd heard in Sunday school and at the academy. So Merrill starts to develop a more sophisticated curriculum, especially for biblical studies that leaves out a lot of sectarian teaching. And he realizes that we've just got to have better training uh, for our religion teachers, uh, which we don't always appreciate that uh, prior to this time, you know, teaching religion was kind of an amateur job in the church. There were no professional religion teachers prior to the first seminary being constructed. And in a church where, you know, your bishop or your stake president or your local ecclesiastical leader is also going to be a mechanic or a lawyer or a doctor, what's the role of a professional religion scholar? In fact, there's still sometimes tension in the church today over what the role of religious scholars is in a church that's led by lay clergy, uh, the prophet of the church right now. Russell M. Nelson is a heart surgeon. How does a guy like me fit into a church that's led by a prophet or apostle? It's kind of that whole fisherman versus Pharisees dichotomy that you see in the New Testament where, you know, do we go with the Pharisees who were learned to know the law or do we go with guys like Peter uh, that were called um, to preach the gospel. And I realize in this analogy, I'm a Pharisee, uh, but but I'm okay with it. There were good Pharisees too. I mean, Paul was a Pharisee, so I'm fine. I found it really interesting how BYU's Department of Religion was connected to this time when they were trying to build up the seminaries. Can you describe that? Yeah. So the, the crisis where the seminaries are almost banned that happens in 1930 Uh, sort of leads Merrill to realize we've got to have better training. And so Merrill um, starts to 
find a way to train religion teachers better. And he noticed that at BYU, which is the, the church's primary institution of higher education, there was no religion department. I mean, there was, but it was one guy. It was George Brimhall, who was the former president of BYU. And other than that, there were no professional religion scholars. They were following the academy model where a person taught religion part-time, but was really an expert in a different subject. Merrill felt like there was something valuable in having experts in religion at the university. The primary thing he was looking for was people that would get expertise in religious studies so that they could train seminary teachers. And so during the early 1930s, he starts trying to find a divinity school that will interact with them. But Latter-day Saints are still thought of as polygamists. They're persona non grata at a lot of uh, universities. In fact, the only one he could find that would interact with them really was the University of Chicago, which is this really liberal school, uh, but has some really gifted scholars, Edwin Goodspeed and a couple other people. And they start bringing these people out to BYU to train all the seminary teachers and the seminary teachers just eat it up. They, they love it. Uh, so Merrill decides, well, well, why don't we grow some scholars from our own crop. So he recruits a number of prominent teachers and sends them to the University of Chicago to obtain training in, in, in religion, whether it's ancient scripture, whether it's uh, church history, and starts it with the idea that there's going to be a department of religion at BYU that not only teaches students, but also can teach and train seminary teachers so that they're not relying on, you know, what they learned in Sunday school so that they're up to date. Merrill just had immense faith in education and saw having professional scholars of religion as a major, major uh, asset to the church. And I think, um, I hope, the last 90 years since he started this experiment have, have proved him correct. So they call this episode the Chicago Experiment. How many yeah. Latter-day Saints get PhDs from the university there? I've identified about 13 students that went to the University of Chicago. Now, this is a, a drop in the bucket because there have been people like Merrill for decades that have been going east. In fact, Thomas Simpson's written a great book on Latter-day Saints at Eastern Universities. He'd be a great guest for your podcast. But there were about 13 that went there. And I think of the 13 that went, about four or five got their PhDs. Among these are some big names like Sidney Sperry who uh, is practically seen as the father of the religion department where I teach, um, T. Edgar Lyon, who T. Edgar Lyon um, becomes the head of the Institute of Religion at the University of Utah and really does a ton for church history. A lot of Nauvoo Restoration Inc. that restored a lot of Nauvoo today was started by T. Edgar Lyon. Other people like Russell Swenson becomes an expert in, in Christian history, Daryl Chase, uh, later on becomes president of Utah State University. Uh, Wes Lloyd becomes dean of students at Brigham Young University. Uh, all these people become really, really influential um, in the church, but they also have to kind of fight their way through that devil in the deep blue sea dichotomy, right? Where this guy has a PhD in religion, so does he know more about the Bible than the apostles and prophets do? And for the first little while after they come back, I think some of them were were shocked at, at how much resistance they met to sort of try and professionalize uh, religious studies. Uh, for instance, George Tanner was one of the uh, Guys that went to uh, Chicago, he gets brought back and made the head of the Moscow Institute in Moscow, Idaho. He writes his thesis on the history of the word of wisdom on Latter-day Saint health practices. And one of the things that Tanner writes is that Joseph Smith and others were, were probably informed of temperance movements at the time and health movements that said that, you know, consumption of alcohol was a bad idea and things like that. And so Tanner wasn't writing anything that would be seen as offensive or or faith destroying today, you know, he was just basically contextualizing Joseph Smith and, and where the word of wisdom would have come as a revelation. But a lot of people were offended that, that basically Tanner was saying that Joseph Smith was influenced by outside forces. Uh, Tanner said specifically that some people were offended by the idea that Joseph Smith would have been influenced by the context he was in, that they wanted the word of wisdom to be something that just came out of thin air and was sort of a bolt of lightning 
and didn't like the idea that it may have been something organic that developed in the environment Joseph Smith was in, and then he asked for a revelation. So I, I don't think any of these guys ever left the church, but sometimes it was difficult for them to negotiate church culture, uh, especially being an academic in religious studies in a church at a, at a time when there wasn't very many people um, uh, with that kind of training and background. And I should add, too, then some of them uh, came back from Chicago and went from, you know, the highest discourse of religion to teaching teenagers again. Like Daryl Chase wrote a letter where he said, God of my fathers, why am I so cursed to teach teenagers? So for some of them, it was hard to kind of adapt from the university to go back to teaching high school students. But most of them eventually wound up teaching college students and made some major impact there. Now, Joseph Merrill, he's the church commissioner for education for a while, but then he's he becomes an apostle after a couple of years. Can you give us a highlight of some of the things he did while he was an apostle? Yeah, so he he serves as church commissioner for five years, from 1928 to 33. Then he gets made a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, and he's immediately sent to the European Mission, which is based in London, uh, which is kind of, it's a tough assignment. The pattern is, is that they generally sent the newest and kind of <laughs> most articulate apostles to the European mission. So uh, James E. Talmadge is president of the European mission. Joseph Merrill replaces Richard R. Lyman, who's also seen as a real heavy hitter. He's a, he's a fellow professor from the University of Utah. Um, he goes to England in a particularly trying time and presides over all the European missions. So on any given day, he could be traveling to Holland or to uh, Germany. There was a minor controversy because uh, Joseph Merrill had a picture of himself taken where he was speaking at a gathering of religions, and there was a flag with a swastika uh, in the background. Now, Merrill was not supportive of the Nazi party or what they were doing. He was just kind of in that environment when he was there, but it caused a minor stir back in Utah when a photograph of an apostle uh, in a room where there was a swastika. This was all pre-World War II. He's mission president from 33 to 36. But he does sort of get a front row seat to the rise of Nazism in Germany and leaves his mission very, very disturbed over the trends that are happening in Europe and what is going to happen there eventually. There's also good stuff too. Merrill realizes that the missionary materials and methods they're using are totally outdated. Like, this was still a time when a person would go down to Hyde Park in London and put down a soapbox and stand up and start preaching. And he just basically said, this just isn't working, guys. So he does what he does at every other place that he serves. He innovates. So he starts saying, well, what if we did radio shows or what if we did slideshows or, you know, let's use audio visual stuff. Let's make movies or things like that that would bring people in. Let's uh, use new media. And one of his missionaries, one of his assistants is a really gifted guy named Gordon B. Hinckley, who later on is going to become president of the church, who Merrill recruits to basically create this new media. In fact, when Hinckley's done with his mission, Merrill sends him home to meet with the first presidency to basically tell them that they need to update their missionary materials. And the first presidency is so impressed with Gordon B. Hinckley that they give him a job creating this stuff. So in the 1930s, Gordon B. Hinckley starts creating radio shows. Eventually, he's going to be the person that pioneers the use of film in temple ordinances, um, the church's media practice. He's present in the church when the website of the church is launched. I mean, the next 70 years are impacted by this missionary that Merrill recruits and, um, and basically sends home to tell the church, it's time for us to leave the, the 1800s and try and figure out what proselyting looks like in the 20th century. So this culture of innovation where he's constantly saying, do we still have to do it this way? Is there a new and better way to do it? Is a theme in his educational practices and also in his ecclesiastical practices. In fact, as an apostle, that's probably the, the best innovation that he's responsible for to tell the church it's time to start using new ways to reach people. Uh, the old stand on the soapbox and preach in the park thing just wasn't working. And so the new missionary initiatives that he helps launch really do kind of propel the church into the 20th century and, and help us have this sustained period of growth that comes in the latter part of the 20th century. The title of your book comes from Joseph Merrill's, it's like a series of lectures put together, The Truth yeah. Seeker and Mormonism. As a scientist, 
how what was his understanding of how science and religion kind of fit together what did you gain from that well uh, one question um, that i had to deal with was how come merrill isn't as well known as people like james e talmage or johnny Witso, who really lived around the same time uh, johnny Witso and merrill die the same year uh, they're both affiliated with the University of Utah, so is James E. Talmadge. Number one thing I could find was that John A. Widsow and James E. Talmadge wrote books. Joseph Merrill didn't. Uh, he's a scientist, and I don't think he was ever super comfortable as a writer. So I tried to find, did he write a book? And what I found was The Truth Seeker and Mormonism, which isn't well known today, and isn't really a book. In the late 1940s, he gave a series of radio addresses. And surprisingly, I mean, in all his general conference of talk, talks, he talks more like a scientist than a preacher, to be honest. The true seeker in Mormonism is him going into some very, very sophisticated science, especially for the time period, and basically explaining how it doesn't affect his testimony. That, in fact, he saw science as a way to strengthen his testimony. And it seems like whenever we talk about science and religion, the conversation always centers around evolution, uh, the age of the earth biology and things like that. Merrill uh, didn't have much expertise in any of those areas. He was a chemist and a physicist and a cosmologist. And so Merrill in, in a typical discourse wouldn't bring up evolution because it doesn't seem like he cared that much about it. Uh, Merrill was constantly saying, okay, we could argue about evolution in the age of the earth, but why aren't we looking at how incredible the cosmos is and how much order there is. Uh, one of his discourses is built around this, this quotation from Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is, is prominently known as an atheist. And when someone asks him why he's an atheist, uh, Edison just basically responds, nature is not kind to man. Uh, so Merrill writes a, a discourse, um, a radio address called Nature is Kind to Man, where he basically explains like how perfect everything had to be for mankind to exist on the earth that we exist on. Like how the temperature and the weather and the solar radiation and you name it, this after this after this, are all perfectly aligned for the creation of mankind and for us to have a, a beautiful world to exist in. And actually, um, that was another favorite part of this was to sort of sit down because at the time I was a grad student, right? I'm, I'm going through the same thing Merrill's going through and see how this really intelligent person was able to say, science isn't something that should detract from your faith. It can be something that enhances your faith. It can be something that causes you to see the world as more beautiful, as more wonderful, as more amazing. Um, when, when he starts the Institutes of Religion program, uh, for instance, he writes this letter to um, the first institute director, and one of the things he says, I'll, I'll read this, he says, I am convinced that religion is as reasonable as science, that religious truths and scientific truths nowhere are in conflict, that there is one great unifying purpose extending throughout all of creation, that we are living in a wonderful, though at the present time, deeply mysterious world. And there is an all-wise, all-powerful creator at the back of it all. So he, he sees institutes and seminaries as part of this work to bridge science and religion. That you could uh, basically take a biology class in high school and then walk over and have your seminary teacher explain why your biology class doesn't conflict with the scriptures. Uh, that you could believe in and be both. And beyond that, one of the wonderful things about Merrill was not having the answers as a scientist, wasn't a source of distress. It was a source of wonder. You know, Merrill's, I found this phrase that shows up all the time in his writings, this little couplet, truth is truth where it is found on Christian or on heathen ground. And so for Merrill, if he's learning about, you know, Jesus Christ, that's truth. Great. If he's learning about particle physics, that's truth. That's great. That was ultimately where the name of the book Truth Seeker came from, was because this guy really didn't draw a hard line between spiritual truths and physical truths. He just saw them all as the same thing. Like, I'm just going to seek truth wherever it is. And if there's things that I, I don't know, I love his phrase where he says, we're living in a wonderful, though the present time, deeply mysterious world. The mystery wasn't something that bothered him. He didn't have to have every single thing pinned down because just the act of discovery 
excited him, whether it was discovering a new religious truth or whether it was discovering a new scientific truth, discovery was really something that propelled him. He was deeply curious about the world around him. And these lectures do kind of highlight how he saw science as another approach to truth, that religion and science, like he says, are, are two ways of looking at the same subject and, and shouldn't be set up to compete with each other, but should exist in harmony with each other. And now you can't learn, I guess, everything from sources. If you're able to go back in time and ask Joseph Merrill a question, was there something you'd want to ask him about? Gosh, that's a really good question, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, I'd want to sit down with him near the end of his life after he has lost those three women uh, that I talked about. Laura, his wife, Millie, his wife, and Laura, his daughter. Because I, I, I found hints here and there that there were times when his faith in science and religion was shaken. Um, when, <laughs> when, when, his second, when his daughter gets cancer, and it's the same kind of cancer that his wife dies of, he writes something like, if I had just known the principles of the word of wisdom better, maybe I could have saved her from dying of cancer. And this link between science and religion, he sees as something like, hey, the word of wisdom was God giving us an understanding of the human body that we hadn't gained yet empirically. I'd want to sit down and say, what are your views on science and religion now? Because it, it's that poignant episode near the end of his life when he's an old man. And by the way, I, I talked to one of his granddaughters who's still alive. She made a sketch of him. Uh, during this time period when his daughter was dying and he just looked like he was worried and, and a little bit haggard and a little sad like there was sort of a sadness to his countenance uh, i would ask him like have you reached the point where you've realized yet that there's some things we don't have an answer to like i think he thought that religion or science could answer every question and it seems like the last two years of his life were kind of this poignant exploration of what are the limits of those two things like where does faith come into play? We've got religious truths, we've got scientific truths, but both religion and science acknowledge that there are some things that we do not know and many things that we cannot control, no matter how hard we try. And watching his daughter, who was, you know, just in her late 20s, early 30s, waste away must have caused him to reflect deeply on why faith remains a necessary part of the equation. That whether you believe in science or religion or you believe in them both, like he did with all of his heart, there has to be a moment where you are willing to say, I don't know why this is happening and I can't control it, so thy will be done. Um, I'd love to talk to him about the last few years of his life. Now my mind's going crazy. I can think of a, you know, a ton of other things I'd love to talk to him about. Uh, too, some to just fill in historic, historiographical gaps and some to just get his feelings or opinion um, on things. In a lot of ways, my study of him and his, his letters, his correspondence, his writings, he's been a mentor to me, helped me through some difficult moments where my faith was maybe uh, weak and helped me sort of have a guide to understand that you can be a well-educated person, which I'd, I'd like to think I am. Uh, and also be a person of faith, that those two worlds uh, can coexist in, in one mind and exist peacefully and harmoniously. So we're coming close to the end of our time. So I just want to ask, what is next for Casey Paul Griffiths? Well, the next big thing, Andrew Bolton, who I, I think a lot of your listeners will know, and I have been editing, I mentioned this earlier, a collection of essays uh, from scholars in Community of Christ and scholars in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this might be the first joint publishing venture <laughs> uh, between Community of Christ and, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so, as we speak, right up until the moment I jumped onto the Zoom call with you, I, I got those back from our reviewers, and I'm editing them. And Andrew and I are working on the design and the final look of the book, and we're hoping that that's out um, late this year. And so um, just building bridges uh, between, between all faiths, um, but especially between those faiths that belong to the Restoration family is, is how I, uh, that's my next big project lined up. And, and I see that as, you know, an important part of my, my work. Um, I want to bring the family back together uh, because there's so much good that I've seen on every side of everything. And we, 
we are a family and we need to act like family. Well, Casey, thank you so much for joining us today. I've learned so much from you and from this book, and I am so excited for this next book. Me too. Me too. Honestly, I think it's going to be wonderful. We want to thank you for tuning into the Whitmercast. This podcast is produced with the help of Bryce Blankenagel, Catherine Pollock, Jill Brim, Joe Geisner, Catherine Hill, and Rachel Killebrew. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution with Krista McKay as our president. For more information, visit jwha.info where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of the John Whitmer Historical Association, copyright October 2021, all rights reserved.